World War I was long and deadly. It involved most of the major nations in the world at the time, and some would say it was inevitable. It had to happen. But did it? That's what we want to work out today. At what point did it become inevitable? 25 years before, 50 years before, 5 years before, on the day that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. Let's dig into the story and find out when this war became inevitable. It's 1871 and the empires are mostly happy with each other. Britain is off dominating the world and mostly doesn't care about Europe. France is trying to do the same thing but it isn't going quite as well yet. Russia was growing rapidly. Germany is just unified for the first time. Austria-Hungary was crumbling at the edges, but was still a grade A great power. Let's put all of those on a map. Notice Germany's position. Yep, surrounded on all sides by another great power. Let's go through them and what Germany decides to do about all of them. First, France. Before Germany formed, Prussia was the major German power and they are the ones who forcefully and diplomatically united the rest of Germany into one solid country. And they had absolutely destroyed France in a war just before Germany formed. And as a result, France was isolated. It didn't really have any allies or friends that it could rely on. And Germany wants to keep them that way so they can't become a threat. As we've already seen, Britain does not want to get involved in European disagreements. Surprise! that won't last, so Germany can ignore them, for now. That leaves Russia and Austria-Hungary. Wilhelm I, the Kaiser of Germany, and Bismarck, the Chancellor who's doing all the day-to-day -day running of the country, decide to have treaties with both of them, which keeps them both on side. Okay, so Germany's feeling secure, and now they want to start gaining more influence, and possibly some colonies of their own. But in 1878, the first issue rises up. There's one empire we haven't mentioned until now. That's the Ottoman Empire. It was still going at this time, but it was very much crumbling. Russia decides to take advantage and attack them. They beat them easily. And afterwards, they force the Ottomans to create Greater Bulgaria, which is within the Ottoman Empire officially. But really, it's a puppet of Russia's to do what it wants. Everyone knew the Ottomans would fail at some point, but Russia being so openly aggressive made Germany and Austria-Hungary nervous. So they call a Great Power Conference. Basically a chance to bring together all the imperialists into one room and talk about any issue they have. It's hosted in Berlin, and the outcome is the Treaty of Berlin. Before I explain what that is, I need to stress that Britain and Russia hate each other. Why is that? Because Britain thinks Russia wants India, and the only places between Russia and India are Persia and Afghanistan. Both Russia and Britain try and get influence and control over both countries, and it's a very tense situation. That's important because at the conference, Britain and Austria-Hungary push for the Treaty of Berlin to undo some of the effects of that Russian-Ottoman war. Basically, most of it was undone, but the Ottomans' European territory was still lost, with Serbia, Romania and Montenegro becoming officially recognised as independent. They had already been basically independent. As added bonuses, Austria-Hungary gains Bosnia-Herzegovina and Britain wins Cyprus for the price of helping the Ottomans out. Despite none of those places or countries having anything to do with the war that had just happened. Russia is pissed off. But Bismarck agrees two secret treaties to smooth things over. The first is a defensive pact with Austria-Hungary. It means that they would defend each other if attacked. When Germany looks around, Austria-Hungary are the only great power left who is willing to go for an alliance. But Austria had problems of their own. The other secret treaty was a non-aggression pact with Russia, which means they will stay out of each other's way so long as they didn't attack each other's allies. So we're really kind of back to where we were before the war, at least in terms of the relations between all of them. Sure, Russia's a bit more suspicious, but we're no closer to the big war yet. Bismarck has been pretty important to how Germany has carried out diplomacy since it formed. That all changes when Wilhelm II comes to the throne in 1888. He doesn't want to be the figurehead while Bismarck does all the fun stuff. So he sacks him. He wants direct control and to make Germany a world power. One of the first things he does is cancel the secret treaty with Russia. He thinks it's too risky if the German people find out it exists. Plus, he thinks that with the Russian Tsar being his cousin, he can sort any issues out between them. Let's see how that goes then. Well, remember that France are isolated over here, surrounded by Germany who hate them, and Britain who have mostly historically hated them. And now, Russia are isolated. Guess what? They ally each other. Wilhelm has thrown poor old France a lifeline without realising it. This will not be the last diplomatic mistake he makes, but his main concern is still becoming a world power. What are the steps he needs to take to do that? 
Step one, look at Britain. They are the template of what a world power is. Look at those colonies. Look at that navy that keeps them under control. Step two, build a navy just like Britain's. This sets off alarm bells in England. Unofficially, Britain had a standard to ensure they had the most powerful navy in the world. It was called the Two Power Standard. Effectively, their navy needs to be as strong as the next two biggest navies combined. Wilhelm isn't doing this to scare them. Instead, he thinks that if Germany chip away at that two power standard, Britain will want to work with their German brothers. This does not happen. Britain can only think that Germany wants to take its empire, just like Russia does. A naval arms race starts. So Britain is a bit rattled, but we're still nowhere near to World War I being inevitable, yet. And having not had any real alliances for almost a hundred years, they decide to ally Drum roll, please. Japan. Japan can't believe their luck. This leads us to the next little war that leads into the big one. The Russo-Japanese War. Japan declares war on Russia in 1904, mostly because of some issues in ports. It's unimportant. Remember that France and Russia are allied and that Germany would still like them on their side. So they should help fight against Japan to help, right? But this is what happens when the most powerful country in the world has alliances. It throws things out of balance. Japan knows that France probably won't fight Britain, so that rules out that alliance. Germany won't risk it either. This isn't an accident either. Remember that Britain hates Russia, so they are indirectly helping Japan to beat them. And to make sure that France doesn't get involved, France and Britain come to a little arrangement. It's called the Entente Cordiale, an attempt to bring the two countries together at last. Initially, the focus is on their colonies, especially North Africa. France will get Algiers and Morocco under their sphere of influence. Britain will get Egypt. Nice and easy, clean cut. This will have consequences. France leaves Russia to lose to Japan. Russia is a little bit isolated. Now, if you know how the alliances work out at the beginning of World War I, you're probably a bit curious as to how they get from where they are now to where they are then. Let's find out. First, let's check back in on the arms race between Britain and Germany. In 1905, Britain invents the Dreadnought, a ship so powerful it makes any older ship obsolete. You'd think that would be game over for Germany, but actually it's the opposite. With a new type of ship they can start building at the same time as Britain, they can keep up to the same standard. In 10 or 20 years, they'll be equal with each other. Wilhelm has another problem though. The Entente Cordiale was very strange. Britain doesn't get involved in European issues to this level. Also, they historically hate France. He needs to make them fall out, and he decides Morocco is the place to do it. Wilhelm shows up at Tangier. He gives a speech supporting Morocco's independence, says that no people should have to be colonized by others, which is rich. He insists on another great power conference to thrash it out. But he isn't trying to be nice to Morocco. This is just a convenient way to piss France off. Which works. The French Prime Minister Delcas is furious. He basically says f off to the idea of a conference to decide something that's already been decided. But no one in France is on his side. They don't want another war with the people that beat them so easily recently. He resigns and everyone meets up for another conference. Wilhelm and Germany have France exactly where they want them. But at the conference, there's a problem. We haven't mentioned them yet because they weren't a great power, but the first blow is that Italy doesn't support Germany but they are Germany's ally. Next up, Britain backs France, which shouldn't have been that surprising given they had only agreed to Morocco being French a few years before. Austria-Hungary, their full-on ally, gives them lukewarm support and basically tells them that this aggressive diplomacy is deeply uncool. Keep it chill, Wilhelm. Germany insisted on this conference, but all it's actually done is bring France and Britain closer. And now being close to France means Britain needs to at least be civil with Russia. They get to know each other better at the conference. They start signing agreements together to sort out the Persian issue. Britain can chill in India and stop having so much manpower taking up expecting a Russian invasion. And Russia can stop preparing for a war with Britain. This little trio becomes known as the Triple Entente. But it's only a loose alliance, for now. So this is where Wilhelm should have taken a step back and re-evaluated his method to become a world power. He had driven Russia and Britain who hated each other to be virtually friends. Add to the fact that Britain and France were now closer when the point of the conference was to drive them apart. But he thinks he needs to double down on this. 
and if anything, be more aggressive. And this leads us to the point where we can say whether the big war, the Great War, World War I, was inevitable. But first, we need to go back to Morocco. 1911. After the previous conference, France keeps control of Morocco. But there are certain rules like not sending their army there without reason, and definitely not keeping it there all the time. So one day they send their army there. You see they had some protests and riots, and they need to go there real quick and just crush them. Britain is not happy about this and becomes suspicious of France. This is Wilhelm's chance to break them up. So what does he do? He sends warships to Morocco. Perfectly reasonable. Unless you're Britain. They are horrified that Germany would send their navy to intimidate France like this. Also, control of Morocco gives control of who can enter the Mediterranean. And Britain cares a lot about that. They forgive France and fully back the Triple Entente. It's now a tightly knitted group between Britain, France and Russia. Nevertheless, Wilhelm gets something out of it too. They let France have Morocco, which is already decided by everyone else, and they get Cameroon, as they call it, instead. Wilhelm's tactics worked, I guess, to him anyway. But this was a case where diplomacy might have actually got him closer to what he wanted. But we knew already that Wilhelm isn't really capable of good diplomacy. Meanwhile, the naval arms race has actually died down a bit since 1905. Britain decides to be a bit more chill. But this is still a point that we can say that war became very, very likely from. How come? Well, you have two clear alliances. One, the German-Austrian alliance that is acting aggressively. And the other, the Triple Entente that is designed to stop the other alliance winning. Colonialism, a European invention, has always been something happening somewhere else that you could contain the effects of, even if there were disagreements. The Morocco crisis had shown colonialism was starting to affect what happened in Europe much more directly. Most nations in Europe start getting ready for war. The people start talking about the possibility of war. The actual war we ended up with, triggered in Serbia, wasn't strictly inevitable. But a large war between these great powers was extremely likely sooner or later from 1911 onwards. And until now, we've taken a fairly critical view of Wilhelm II. Specifically tried to avoid giving any one nation blame here. But I haven't always been so controlled. Sometimes I may even try and blame a specific country. Not for the whole thing, but to show how they did contribute more than we think. And that country is Britain. And that's exactly what you'll be able to work out for yourself between this video and the one on screen right now.